Okay, I think I'm supposed to click got it. There we go. Oh, good day. Uh, in 1958, uh, then President Eisenhower, upon the, uh, the recommendation of the American Bar Association, established Law Day as a time to celebrate the American heritage of liberty, justice, and equality under the law. In 1961, by joint resolution of Congress, May 1st was established as the day to celebrate Law Day. This is our 65th anniversary of Law Day. Our theme is civics, civility, and collaboration, the cornerstones of democracy. The American Bar Association President Deborah Enix Ross indicated her reasons for picking this title. We have to elevate the, th elevate the three C's, civics, civility, and collaboration for all to see and hear, because if we don't, our legal and justice systems will lose another C, and that's confidence from the public. We just cannot allow yet another C, cynicism, to drown out the value of law and democracy as a guarantor of liberty, justice, opportunity, human rights, dignity, and peace. We are honored to have a most experienced leader to discuss his experiences regarding these topics. Mark DeSalne has served in the House of Representatives since 2015. Before that, he was in the state Senate for seven years and state assembly for two years. And at the local level, he was a supervisor of the Contra Costa Board of Supervisors, the mayor of Concord, and a member of the Concord Planning Commission. Uh, before that, he was the, uh, the owner operator of uh, various restaurants, which uh, is a youth I quite frequented and enjoyed, uh, enjoyed a lot. Uh, Mark, it's, it's great to, uh, to have you here this afternoon. And it's a pleasure to talk to you regarding your feelings about these important aspects of democracy. Thank you. What I'd like to do, um, uh, I'm going to go through them pretty much in the order that I that I gave, and and would really like to have your input as to uh, your experiences regarding some of these things. Uh, the first, of course, is 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 civics itself, which I would call the uh, the science of civic affairs, uh, how to get things done. And uh, considering the number of hats you've worn in your uh, your civic life. Uh, it seems like you've had to learn a great deal about how to get things done in in various atmospheres and with varying environments. So, so what does what does civics mean to you? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me, and um, I won't tell your audience that I, I now remember you as a, as a client in your youth of uh, restaurants. Um, yes. <laughs> never mind. It wouldn't be judicial of me to go that down that route. But I wasn't um, judicial then. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, well, what does it mean to me? Uh, you know, I, I always think of um, the, the greatest thing you could say in Rome was I am a citizen of Rome. And now, uh, today, I always thought that the greatest thing you could say as an American and, and as a human in the human evolution is I'm a, I'm a citizen of the United States of America. I grew up um, outside of Boston. I was just came in through my Growing up, you drive by Lexington and Concord every day. Every building in Boston has a plaque. So that's probably part of um, my interest. But the founders, you know, times have changed a lot, uh, but they believed in their best, particularly, um, well, Adams and Franklin, the Northern founders um, amongst them, that if you were going to have, be able to govern yourself, you needed a educated, a publicly educated, egalitarianly educated. Franklin started the public school system um, and the public libraries. That that was about civic engagement. So it's about the other C's are communication, community, and what we have in common, which is what the Latin derivative comes from when it comes to community and, co and communication. Mm -hmm. how, did you, how did you first become involved in public, public service? I mean, it, it seemed to me Reading your biography, uh, uh, you didn't start this like some people did as, as, as a young person. This was something you had already been successful in life and, and uh, uh, you were sort of moving on, it seems. Well, I always describe myself as the Forrest Gump of Contra Costa politics. I'm curious enough that I like new opportunities. I actually uh, got involved when my dad was a member of the legislature in Massachusetts. Um, he was a spirit court judge. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out well for him. He was forced to resign in controversy. Uh, so when I graduated from college, um, I changed plans sort of, I, I planned to go to law school in Boston. I decided to 
drive across country. I ended up in San Francisco and decided to stay. And I went into the hotel and restaurant business. So after doing that, I was bored um, for a while. I just sold a restaurant in Berkeley and the local chamber of commerce said, why don't you go on the planning commission? You're bored. So I did. And then two years later, there was a city council meeting and then Pete Wilson appointed me to the board of supervisors back when I was a Republican. Yeah, no, I think is is really an interesting history just because um, similar to, to you mentioned Franklin is, is, is one of those people. He had, he had made his whole career before he really got involved in public, public life. He was doing other good things, but, but public, public life and, uh, and sort of became really a counselor to, uh, to the revolution and a counselor to, to, uh, to many of the conventions that resulted yep. in, our, in our society. Um, I'm just sort of, sort of curious that uh, it's, it's rumored, and I think it's, it's fairly true, that, that, that civics is no longer uh, a topic that's, that's, that's deemed important or is taught in our schools right now. And I'm curious from your comments about you need a well-educated, uh, well-informed society. Um, how is voting public going to get an awareness of what its leaders do and which leaders to vote for based upon what they do if there's, if there's no training of that sort at, uh, at, at some level? Well, it's inter that's a great question given who we just talked about. Um, as somebody who likes to read a lot and um, has visited all of the founders' um, homes, including Franklin's site where he was when he was in London. You know, Franklin uh, was a printer. Uh, he was an indentured printer to his brother uh, when he left and went to Philadelphia. So the communication is part of the problem right now um, of civic engagement is how we get information. Um, you know, Aaron Sorkin's brilliant series on HBO Newsroom was sort of very predicted, predictive um, of where we are now with social media and how algorithms for media and how we get information is very directed. And it's directed on, towards, I mean, this is where AI has already affected us so much when people talk about AI in the future, but how um, social media and media is directed by AI and the algorithm in order to generate more advertising and funding. And a lot of that is based on what we're learning about neuroscience and how you upset people. You're 40% more likely to get clicks um, if, you, if you address the dopamine in the part of the brain that is overstimulated and divisive. The political consultants in both sides are aware of this. So we're, really, we're in a difficult period because there is a business political model to divide us uh, in order to make money. And it's one of our biggest challenges is to let the public know that um, we don't, you know, we, we don't have to shut them all down necessarily. We definitely need guardrails. Uh, but if the public is informed as to what they're getting into and their kids are getting into, I think we can start rebuilding civic education and civic communication, but it's a real problem. So you'd, you'd agree that, that government in general has a responsibility to make um, the, the public aware of these things and to, to make sure the information they're receiving is, is an accurate understanding of how the government works. Yes, and in the context since I'm of the audience here, I'm not a lawyer, but um, I'm a bartending lawyer, I guess you'd say, <laughs> um, caveat emptor. I mean, the founders wanted to get people here, so they flipped um, that buyer beware. So in order to be the, have the buyer beware, um, you have to allow them to have the information as to what the marketing is about mm -hmm. and who is, who is in charge of that. And, and I guess you're concerned with, with anyone who's, who's, who's looked at things about, about just the condition of our news media uh, and, and whether or not you really get an accurate picture of things through, through the news. And I, I guess I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about what your thoughts about as a, as a public leader, uh, how do you feel when, when your, your face appears on the on evening news and, and are they telling you, telling the accurate, or accurate story of what's happening? Well, it's always a challenge um, in communication every time. There was a story on last night and I watched it and I said, that's not exactly what I said, but some of that is just communication. The, the more uh, the wonderful book, the books on social media and neuroscience are getting better every every iteration. The most recent one called The Chaos Machine is very good about connecting 
uh, the neuroscience to the delivery of information um, and how it's driving us apart. I was part of the oversight committee when we brought uh, Mueller in. Um, I was privy to a lot of intelligence meetings about what the Russians were doing. Um, that's now public information. But this is, this is a real time problem to deliberately get us to divide on racial tension um, in particular. The Russians are doing this, the Chinese are doing it, and unfortunately a lot of Americans are doing it to American democracy. The antidote for me in the context of this is the rule of law and taking a deep breath, which is what, you know, a deep breath we now know actually affects the chemicals in our body to get, to get that energy out of the hippocampus and flight flight into, um, into the, out of the frontal cortex, into the hippocampus where you start to go, okay, that's not a, that's not a lion coming to eat me. This is how we solve the problem that we have in front of us. So I do think it's happening, um, but, we as legislators and we as a community, a culture, it always takes us a little longer to figure out how new technology and products are used uh, and so that the buyer can be aware and be informed as to what they're purchasing. So I, I just started reading again a, a series of books that I read a long time ago, and one of them was 1984. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, I don't know if he was, he was just a mind reader, but, but uh, or a historical perceiver, but uh, it, it seemed like the same same sort of people we worried about. He was worried about then, and and uh, part of the story is uh, although the uh, the people to the far east were were our enemies yesterday, now our enemies the uh, the uh, the Asians some other place and kept switching it around, and and this was okay because of the the news sources uh, would convey that immediately. The people accepted that as is the new order, and they followed that. Yeah, yeah. It's funny you mentioned that because I often think when I'm on the floor of the House of Representatives, I'm part of one of his, his previous books, um, oh, yeah. Animal Farm. So Animal Farm, yeah, yeah. 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 So I look at some of my farm? colleagues and I'm like, "That's pig." That's you know. Yeah. I also yeah. think of Catcher in the Rye, but that's a whole other story. Yeah. No, but it, it's true how prophetic that was. Uh, the movie The Matrix. I, I think about often how prophetic that was uh, and how we've changed and. You know, authenticity, thoughtfulness, all the things that we learned from the British, the Romans, the Greeks, and when we were aware of them, Far Eastern philosophy, uh, we have to relearn that. Mm -hmm. Are there any programs that, that, that Congress is actually doing to address these sorts of shortcomings on, on civics awareness? Uh, yeah, uh, well, I'm on the Education Committee. I'm now a fairly senior member. Uh, my predecessor was the chair, um, George Miller. So we're trying to, I'm very active in those conversations. Uh, it's a struggle. Um, well, you mentioned um, how we get information in newspapers. I started a group uh, with David Cicilline, a member from um, Providence, Rhode Island, to talk about print media, um, because how we, how we digest information is different in the print form than we do in, in the media form, including social media. There's a wonderful book called The Shallows about this, about what it's happening to um, the actual size of human skulls, about how we process information and retain it. But what's happened in the print media is disastrous in this country. Um, basically, you've got the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, Chicago Tribune, and LA Times, and then the Alden Financial Group and what they've done to the Bay Area News Group is really quite alarming. So all of that in the civic side is how do you get kids to read history in public school, uh, retain that information as a narrative and a cause and effect from my perspective, and relate that to civic in engagement. Unfortunately, in the politicized world of um, uh, critical, critical race uh, in, uh, studies, it's taken out of context and used to divide us. So when I approach my colleagues on the other side and I'm like, listen, I'm not interested in Democrats or Republicans. We need to create American citizens who can decide whether they wanna be conservative or liberal or whatever. Uh, but members are hesitant to do that because I think we are, to the previous question about the matrix, is we're sort of conditioned to how are we gonna leverage this to help our tribe rather than just so stop. It's about re-engaging American democracy and civic literacy, which has been a lot of work on done on. Mm -hmm. Now it's difficult now when you see uh, bookstores and libraries closing or not being used for, for the, uh, the value of, of what came before, but rather for uh, 
uh, how many books on tape can I get and uh, other things of that sort. Uh, we haven't become a literate society that way. I think we, we've, uh, at least this is my view and I'm um, not sort of yours, but I'm just concerned about that aspect of it because it seems like uh, people can be misled more easily uh, through TV and and uh, and other other um, visual sources than that they can be with books and and, and printed material. Can you give me a thumbnail sketch just for for uh, my understanding of civics? Um, it was my understanding about the time you get in Congress, uh, they tell you forget out what you think you know about Congress. Here's our here's our rule book, and and this is how you get things done. Uh, I don't mean to be simplify about it, but is that accurate that we really don't understand the process of, of Congress itself? Well, that's that old story about sausage and yes. laws, um, not wanting to see it. I actually think it, when it's done right, I, I think of when I go on the House floor, that's the sancta sanctorum to me, to human evolution. Um, and it's a Roman form, it's Athens, uh, and, you know, it, all of that. I'm an inheritor of that. We are. Uh, and it, but that is a double-edged sword because it's discouraging to see that, you know, progress isn't linear with humans. Uh, it may be over the long term, but we do these. And right now we're at a time where it's not working. Um, and it's quite discouraging, uh, partially to be there after a long career at the other levels. Uh, and it's about, you know, one of the things that's so frustrating is it's not about, one of my favorite stories about the founders is, Jefferson, uh, when he first opened Monticello, somebody came into the vestibule and said, wait a minute, why do you have Hamilton's bust facing your bust? And Jefferson said to the visitor, he says, it, when I said, why do you have that? You don't agree with Hamilton on anything. And Jefferson's response was, that's why. And uh, th that to me, that's what it's supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. now, I couldn't get elected in a lot of my colleagues districts, they couldn't get elected in mine. The house works that way, but we're not respectful uh, for a variety of reasons of that. Uh, myself is one of the more progressive liberal members. Um, sometimes people on the left will say, why'd you agree with that person? I said, because they don't represent a district next to Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're in Alabama, Mississippi. I'm trying to figure out a product that reflects the whole country. And yeah, I think they should change, but you can't get there from here in this institution. And lots of times you find out maybe you shouldn't have in hindsight. So it, it is, uh, the, the other thing just briefly is the um, supply chain of civic engagement. There are more people getting elected to Congress who have never been elected to office before. Mm -hmm. So in my view, and maybe this is subjective given my course, they didn't serve the apprenticeship to understand how the system works and not just Congress, but where it is in context to local government, states' rights. I always joke to people as a liberal Democrat who grew up in Boston, I was never a states' rights person until I became a member of Congress and I saw people from the South wanting to change California. Yes, yes. <laughs> now it's time to rethink that. that, uh, that. <laughs> That's fine, you go ahead and do that, but don't mess us up. Because you know some of the things I've done at a, at a smaller level and, and you were doing, I assume, when you were mayor of, of, of the city of Concord and, and uh, the board of supervisors, um, it starts with going out to lunch with somebody yep. and, uh, and, and talking through certain things and not, not so much to get them to agree, but so you understand where the pressure points are for them and they understand the pressure points are for you. And then you try to, to, uh, to work through that. Is that, is that more, a, more description of how things are done in Congress rather than the committee meetings that we see sometimes televised, uh, where, where, uh, um, from my perspective, it looks like a courtroom with both sides being represented and there's no judge. Yeah, Goal strikes. that's a good analogy. Um, I, I think it's the pressure of the times we're under. I mean, the social models changed. Members used to take their family back there um, and the kids would go to, I mean, Congressman Miller's kids, I think went to school back there. Um, that used to be the model, Republicans and Democrats, they saw each other, they golfed on the weekends. Um, travel has changed that, uh, divorce rates have changed that, um, two income households, all those things. So we're trying to figure out how to adapt to that. But this conversational part, being thoughtful, being empathetic, understanding that you're talking to another human being with a unique perspective and their own sociology of reality, uh, technology, we're trying to adapt to that. 
Um, and it's easier to disassociate people as human beings, whether you're in the military or in the legislature, when you don't see them as human beings. Mm -hmm. Because that, that sort of leads on to the, the second C that we're going to talk to today. And that, and that just deals with civility, you know, polite attention or expression, or uh, one of the, the people that that I used to work with when I first started out said, oh, no, you know, uh, civility is the is the grease that uh, that makes things go smoothly with others. And uh, and, you know, at least from my perspective, you've been known as a calm, respectful, respectful, courteous political leader. Um, can you give me some sense of civility in your daily life? What's what's it like in, in your work? Civility. How does that work? Does it not work? Does it view you as some sort of uh, always oh, he's, he's a coward, he's being so nice to me, he should be, you know, aggressive, this, that, and the other. Uh, how does civility work in, in the political context? Uh, I tell you, if, when I first got back to Congress, I was on the oversight committee, um, very, I don't want to be on it, because I, in my previous experience was, that was nonpartisan. Uh, at the local level and state level, I was the only Republican on the Board of Supervisors, although the joke was I was more liberal than the three Democrats at the time. Yeah. But oversight was about the proper viewing of the operations of government. Are you running it efficiently? Which I think it should be nonpartisan. Um, if somebody conservative wants to have, make sure the taxpayer doesn't pay as much, if I want to help the social safety net, I don't those are not contradictory, not they're mutually, not mutually exclusive, if that's right. So um, oversight in the Congress is in those days was Mark Meadows and Jim Jordan and screaming at one another. So I remember going in and somebody being very passive aggressive. And I said, wait, I grew up in a Boston Irish Catholic household. I know about passive aggressive behavior <laughs> and I was taught not to respond. So it was good. I, I told my mother, I said, that was good training. Um, I just think calming people down and trying to bring them back to civility, you learn that in a courtroom, um, get back to the facts, get back to the law, and let's find out what really happened. Um, and we have to get back there, but there are, as I've said before, there are a lot of vested self-interests who don't want us to get back to that. I know we, we most recently witnessed the, um, the selection of the Speaker of the House, uh, your house, and uh, um, there seemed to be a lot of stuff that was going when votes weren't being taken. Um, pretty, pretty aggressive stuff, I would say, uh, that, uh, that I understand the current speaker had to, to go through and touch all the bases to get things done. Uh, but, the, but the bottom line was, it didn't seem to me to be um, the calm, depassioned, uh, you know, deliberative body that I thought it was. <laughs> it's not. It is not. One of my big disappointments is one of the joys I've gotten from my public life probably comes from owning a restaurant, owning a business. You can't be too ideological. You come from your own perspective and who people, how people taught you, your mentors, um, but you have to problem solve. And that's the way the institution used to function. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about people saying, well, Biden got along with Dixocrats who were racist, um, you know, Joe Cannon before Biden and all these stories. Well, that doesn't mean you accepted their perspective. I mean, I don't eliminate Jefferson's genius because he did bad things. Um, so we've got to get back to that. Uh, and it, it, I think it requires, I think personally, the antidote for all of that, for me personally, is to be a, just one member who's a model for take a deep breath, let's look at the history, let's solve the problem, acknowledging that there are 535 members of Congress, 435 House members representing 325 million people on a planet with $7.3 billion, billion, who still look at us as a city on a hill. Um, so how do we just calm down and figure out how to be civil and how to accomplish um, a product for the whole country, not just for one district? In your own personal experience, has that, has that process worked well for you rather than what I would consider the... Uh the other more aggressive, uh, disrespectful type type thing that I sometimes see in politicians? I don't know. It, it is who I am. It's what I believe. I mean, as part of my reading and my Jesuit education was um, the Greeks and the, and the Romans at their best, the Republic, it was about your inner journey first till you went out in the community. So Socrates, know thyself. When I'm at my best, it's be calm. Think about how you solve problems and help other people 
by being quiet. Because of the impact on media and political, um, people want to get attention a lot, and people forget that most people don't remember who their member of Congress is if they know who they are now. The value of your work is what you accomplish for other people, not whether you're remembered or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, just while, you, while you're on that, that topic, do, do Congress members, you know, you're on TV a lot, your committee meetings are photographed and filmed and, and on the nightly news and things like this. Do they ever watch them and realize how, um, how uncivil they appear or how their attempts at civility uh, come across as just being insincere? Uh, the, I think they watch them and see everything but the last part. <laughs> okay. They don't, they don't see themselves as being insincere or that it's unproductive because this is where the matrix comes. Uh, and when you realize what's happening to our brain structure um, and that book, The Shallows in the long term, but the, the, uh, chaos machine in the nearer term, people are becoming caricatures because they don't know who they are. And the response is all Pavlov's dog is, how many likes do I have? One of my first hearings that I went to, I was looking around at what members were doing when there was a big turnout members and 90% of the members were looking at their Twitter, Twitter feed. And I don't, know how to, I don't know how to access my Twitter feed deliberately because I tried it twice, I thought it was stupid. <laughs> Yeah. So I have yeah. young people do that and tell me where I'm screwing up. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I wanted to talk about, just, you know, it isn't just just government, of course, it's also our society in general. Um, I don't remember a time in my life where, where I've seen more road rage. I've seen more people uh, disrespecting other people and in, in, not just in, in, in racial realms, but in in business realms and all sorts of realms that have nothing to do with the typical civil rights things that we see. Um, we also have a situation where, well, let's, let's deal with, with that first. Is there something that, that we could do as a, um, as a community, as a culture, uh, to try and have some impact upon those sorts of reactions between ourselves? Uh, you know, that, that goes along with civility too. And I'm, I'm just sort of curious how you, you give your population a shot of civility. Um, well, on the road rage stuff, I'm a senior member of the transportation committee. I've spent a lot of time on transportation. We just had a meeting with uh, the Department of Transportation to talk about how the statistics are going up in road rage and accidents that are either deliberate or distracted driving was the, we were putting a lot of effort into this. I've spent time with researchers trying to combine uh, the neuroscience with and we're doing this with pilots as well, but not the same thing about paying attention uh, and the attention deficit disorder is now called that people are um, overly stimulated. So it's a real problem. And road rage is another symptom of our problem is that people are so amped up and how they drive. Uh, I mean, we're dealing with this as a transportation safety project mm -hmm. process is, you know, adolescent boys, as they learn how to drive in particular, if they're overstimulated, they're not going to think about taking a deep breath, which is sort of ironic because now with GPS, you really can show that you're not saving any time. You're, you're, and you're, the risk is crazy. So what we can do is what we've been talking about. We've got to slow everybody down and get back to functioning. Um, and a more timely uh, thing is, if somebody puts a lot of time into violence prevention programs and gun violence, what's just happened in the last week um, with Stand Your Ground, at, we've got people so wound up um, that somebody comes, drives up their driveway or knocks on their door. And if they look a certain way or, and, and it's really sad, but they're so overstimulated and they, they're so here in their fight flight mechanism that they're responding in a way disproportionate to the threat. So there is a very significant problem here in our culture and our species right now where people are chemically overstimulated and it's causing all kinds of problems. And we know where it's coming from. There's a wonderful book by a Stanford researcher called Dopamine Nation, um, who I'm going to meet with next week. And she talks about how both drugs, but social media is very targeted based on the neuroscience right now to overstimulate people. And we've got to get, as a culture and a species, we've got to get people to be aware of having dopamine in chemically in balance in order for us to be successful and not be a risk to ourselves and others. So I think the, the one thing that's, that's just a, um, a curiosity for me as an American, 
Um, I see I see these things happening, especially gun violence, and and it seems like it's usually an attack on someone who really is the most innocent of innocents. You know, schools, uh, a uh, a bar where people were just trying to relax. Uh, you know, a party. You know, birthday party. You know. Why, why are people shooting up a birthday party? And I see those happening in the United States. I don't see a similar thing happening in Europe or Asia or other places that maybe I don't know about them. Uh, anything like that that happens there is usually a terrorist type thing rather than the sorts of things that we're experiencing in the United States. And I just don't understand uh, why the difference. You, know, you, you, you mentioned specie, but I think from, from what I just mentioned, it seems like a cultural thing rather than a species thing. Oh, it's definitely a cultural thing. It's fascinating. I've spent a lot of time, as I said, on violence prevention and a lot of time on gun violence. My dad, former judge, is accused of accept, accepting a bribe by the Boston Globe spotlight team and a, a Senate committee uh, investigating in the God, I was a freshman in college, so it was in this, it was 69. Um, he ended up being bankrupt, committed suicide. So I've spent a lot of time and he had a gun in Florida. So we've never found out he got, how he got the access to the gun because we knew he was being treated for depression, but mm -hmm. treatment for depression and addiction in those days was not sophisticated. He had a master's degree in addiction um, from Rutgers and he was sort of a model at trying to do this stuff. So anyways, gun violence, uh, two thirds, 60, 60 to two thirds of the gun deaths in the United States on a, every day are suicide. So it's the proximity of a lethal weapon. Uh, NRA will argue, well, they'll do something else. That's not what the research tells you. Um, um, every other type of suicides are ordinary magnitude, much less likely because we know it's when your brain is overstimulated and you're depressed. And if it's available, you'll do it. So the proximity to a lethal weapon is what makes us different. It's part of our culture. Uh, there's another wonderful book called The Gunning of America, where she, she follows the cultural marketing of guns and American male independence and the identity to that that's closely wrapped into their marketing. Um, so it's very hard to get that changed, even though we have 80, 90 percent approval ratings for more restrictive licensing. And from the public, Republicans and Democrats, we can't get that kind of percentage in the Congress because the NRA culture is so close, in my view, to the male acceptance um, politically that you'll get clobbered with Citizens United special, um, independent, targeted, sophisticated, which culturally just um, paralyzes members of Congress, not just because they'll lose an election, but it'll attack their identity and their community. Because that, that sort of sort of dovetails in some of the things that I'm uh, interested in for, for collaboration, because certainly uh, the way the Congress is situated now, you're so evenly divided, uh, you certainly have to get cooperation with, with some of the people on the other side, uh, because each of your parties uh, has its own little factions and they have their own little favorite things that that's, they won't go along with the, uh, uh, the group if, if uh, um, I guess, if, unless you go along with, with, with their favorite thing. Uh, just on collaboration itself, you know, our country has always been a country to try and find a compromise solution that's going to, uh, to work for the most. Um, working with others, working with others in, in Congress or in uh, state legislatures or in, in local government. Um, how do you do it? How do you get these things done? What sorts of, what sorts of, 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 of process do you go through to collaborate, collaborate with people who uh, uh, clearly in some, some areas they won't agree with you at all, but in others, yeah, we should, we should be willing to do this. Well, it's interpersonal. It, it's 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 the personal relations. I have a, a colleague from the South uh, who's on the education committee with me. She's a senior member and she's about as far right on a voting record as I am left. And we're good friends. Uh, we find opportunities. She likes to introduce me to new Republicans. This is DeSonia. He's our favorite San Francisco socialist. And I always respond the way I say, well, Perfect. you know, Virginia, by your standards, I'm a Trotskyite. Um, and we all laugh, but it's a comedy routine that's so we find things that we work in with common in common and to the civility and compromise part. And we respect the fact that her perspective is different from mine and the voters who vote her are different. And I think that's the antidote is to 
uh, we've had a program, uh, and I don't know who started this, maybe the Aspen Institute, where you would get a, uh, a member of the other party and basically you partner with them and you'd go to their districts and you'd do town halls so that you would um, talk in front of different groups. And I've done it, it was terrific. I actually did one with a, a member from Texas and a, one of his supporters came up and he said, you know, I hated you before I came in here, but now after listening to both of you, I think if I just sent the two of you in the back room, you'd work out the country's problems. So it's that personal engagement um, that I think we have to get back to. And I'm afraid a lot of people don't have the patience for that right now, but it's the only way to get, I think it's the antidote to the problem we're in. Yeah, well, part, part of the the, uh, the curiosity that I saw was, um, you know, we have a super majority, is California's example, we have a super majority uh, of, uh, of Democrats in, in the legislature and in, in government itself in California. And the problem that I see there is that, that the minority party, I don't care if it's the independents or the Republican party, uh, they can be ignored. And the, the legislation that we get is not subject to the sort of uh, healthier criticism I think it would be if the, if the numbers were, were closer, if, if, the, if the other parties, so to speak, had, had the power to get things done. And it seems like your situation in Congress now, you're so equally divided uh, that it is very difficult to get anything done uh, just because of, of, of that sort of division. And you, you look at the number of people who are registered Democrats and, and Republicans, uh, that doesn't tell you the full story because some of those Republicans are moderates and some of them are, uh, are uh, more conservative. And the same is true with the, uh, with the Democrats. Uh, that, that sometimes you don't you don't get that unanimity that that is represented by how many people declare themselves to be one party or the other. So I sort of wonder how you how you go about getting things done. Uh, let's say you wanted to do a program you said on education. My guess is that with your uh, your counterpart, um, many things will be fine until we get to uh, should we allow kids to read Tom Sawyer. Uh, mm -hmm. should, should we do this? Should we do that? Uh, what do we do in education if uh, if a child at the age of 14 wants to identify themselves one way rather than other sexually? Uh, those are the sorts of issues that that may divide you. And I'm not saying inappropriately divide you. I'm saying that's that's identifying what what makes us uh, not go along with something. Can you get around that and, and just go through education programs that you can't agree with? Yes, one of my, one of my, the bill I may be proudest of um, is a bill I did with uh, G.T. Thompson, conservative member from Western Pennsylvania on family engagement centers. We've been able to increase um, the funding for those. And basically the approach we took with the national PTA was um, that uh, these family engagement centers, rather than talking about the role of parents from the right or the left, we know that parents, when they're engaged in their kids' education, irrespective of whether it's two incomes or two in or divorced families or poor uh, people of color, we know family engagement with the school system, with the teachers, the PTA increases their, their success in school and social abilities. So we passed that, uh, it's had bipartisan support. We've increased it when we were in charge of the budget. We've increased it when the Republicans have. Unfortunately, the media and the political consultants, that doesn't divide us and make them money so you don't hear stories about it. So there is work that's done. That's the good news. The bad news is those opportunities are shrinking for a variety of reasons, um, partially because each class that comes in is more a product of this culture of um, be very shallow, respond to simple responses on big issues that don't deal with the complexities, even a little complexity of these are, these are you know, generational long-term challenges um, and they're not as simple as a political soundbite. So I, I think there, there, there also has been a switch in just uh, how public leaders like yourself are identified. It used to be, at least when I was growing up, uh, we live in a Republican, that's small r, Republican form of government where not all of us could stand in a city square and vote on things. I vote on a person because I think this person is wise and experienced and is capable of making the right decision for the country. And it seems like, and this is very narrow view on my part, that we seem to have leaders now who are elected on a cause. And, and that's, that's why they're there. And they have difficulty 
um, uh, differentiating between their cause and other things that, that, that may be necessary in the country. Is that accurate, inaccurate view of, of, of some of your, your fellow Congress people? Yeah, I think that's an accurate view, unfortunately. Um, and I sometimes think that they're cognitively not capable of stopping and thinking and reflecting on, well, I mean, I've had conversations with colleagues, particularly newer colleagues, and I've sat there and thought, hmm, I know I'm having trouble communicating my perspective and on my side, understanding their perspective, but I don't, maybe this person's just not capable of politically, cognitively accepting that maybe my, my perspective has value. Because I, I, you know, I, I envisioned that there were, there were certain things that, that you can collaborate with. Mm -hmm. There are other things that are highly sensitive. And I, 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 I you know, don't, don't mean to be speaking out of turn, but you had mentioned, you know, gun control. If, if you were a Democrat and said, you know, I want to, I don't want to have gun control. I want to have, uh, be able to buy my AK 47s and everything else. Uh, and you tried to collaborate with, with a Republican, would your party leaders have anything to say about, about that particular collaboration? Um, well, your, some of your colleagues would, and people with vested interest on the left would definitely, definitely okay. have a problem with that. And you wouldn't, if, if there was a legitimate reason for you doing that, you're not given the time and the attentions, political attention span to explain why that would be. Mm -hmm. Just you're either for it or against it, and that defines you. Okay, so it's a black and white type type situation. Well, I was because, thinking, you know. Yeah, because we're in the shallows. We're in very okay. superficial. Okay. I mean, you, you experience this in a courtroom, I'm sure, all of you. You know, you, you want to be focused, you want to simplify, but sometimes they're more complicated. Some things, you know, maybe there's something that we missed in the investigation or from one perspective. So that's the purpose of this, of that dialogue. Is there ever a time, I know, in, the court system is much smaller than, than anything you've been involved with, Mark, but is there ever a time when um, the entire system is taken to some sort of retreat and we go over some of the things that you're talking about, um, just about why we differ and how's a good way to approach communicating with each other to try and overcome the areas we can agree with, uh, pass laws along those lines, uh, maybe even take uh, risk in, in passing laws that may be sort of in a marginal area for us, but we still understand the, the overall benefit. Is there ever that sort of retreat that, that Congress or uh, any group in Congress ever takes to try to do this? Yeah. So when you're, when you're uh, first elected, uh, before you're sworn in, there's an initiation and it's bipartisan. So um, you go out to Williamsburg, you get a little history on what happened there um, and you spend time and you develop relationships. I still have relationships with spouses of Republican colleagues that just went to a event at the Library of Congress this week where we were talking about our first bus ride. Um, there are others, there's a problem solvers caucus that is equal um, and they try to figure out ways to work together. So there are, uh, the Aspen Institute is good at this. They're a nonprofit, so they have to be nonpartisan. So they have members from both parties that they invite. So there are, we should do more of them. Okay, because the, 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 the sort of, uh, once again, this, this is, I'm just communicating what I think is, is the public image of things that, that um, our leaders have become very much at poles with each other, very much opposite with each other. Um, opposite poles and, and very difficult to communicate with each other. Is there any institutional change that you think would help us overcome that situation and get us back to the leaders who uh, examine a situation, uh, make a, a wise, tough decision, but make a decision and, and we move forward with that decision? Oh, there's, there's lots, but I would say what we just talked about is institutionalizing more interpersonal opportunities to talk with experts from the outside. One of the big things I've been shocked about in Congress is um, in California, the Legislative Analyst Office started as a by, it has to be, the, the LAO in California has to be hired by consensus of whether, irrespective of who has how many votes in both houses. It's evidence-based an, an analysis of bills. Um, Congress doesn't really have anything like that. We have the General Accounting Office, uh, we have the Congressional Research Service, and then we have the Congressional Budget Office. All of those do different perspectives. I have been trying to get 
uh, as part of a bipartisan effort to monetize, modernize uh, Congress is to have bills and oversight dealt with by that kind of staff that are nonpartisan. If you do this, this is what the research tells us. Um, and unfortunately, we've gone away from that because people who like and make money off of political opinion decisions, as opposed to rational, analytical, informed decisions, um, have created obstacles to that. That's the single biggest thing we could do. The I, Ironically, I was in uh, London a few months ago, and we were meeting about this with the EU, with people who are like-minded, and then in London in the parliament, and uh, they have copied a congressional um, model that Newt Gingrich got rid of because he didn't want dispassionate, nonpartisan analysis of legislation. Mm -hmm. So the English now do it better than we do based on what we stopped and they have replicated. Too bad, huh? Too well, bad. we got to get that back. We have to have nonpartisan analysis yeah. of what we're doing. Just a couple more questions that you've been more generous in time, but I'm just curious because of these these things are sort of current. Um, January 6th, the out, sort of sort of results of January 6th, is that affected in any way the way you do business? Oh, yes. It's been really hard. I found out after January 6th that I was the last member of Congress evacuated from the con from the Capitol. Uh, they had forgotten about me because at the time my immune system uh, my doctors didn't want me to go back. I had to go back because we only had, I think, three votes to get Nancy Pelosi um, elected. I was the 218th vote, which was wonderful. But I had to be put in a room um, off the House floor because my doctors were worried about my exposure during COVID and my immune system. So when everybody was evacuated, they had to come back and get me after the building had almost been taken over. Um, so it's had a big effect. And it, it's, uh, I, you know, I've got post-traumatic stress. To have that building and the way I feel about it be attacked in that manner and be instigated by the President of the United States. Um, I have a very dear friend who's a retired attorney um, and he's very conservative and he called me and he said, you know, I've read about January 6th, it wasn't that bad. I said, Dave, stop. Yeah. That's your perspective. You were in Arizona, retired. I was in that building, that's, it wasn't, it was a bigger thing than you're actually experiencing in terms of its deliberate attempt to diminish the importance of collaboration and what that building is all about. Mm -hmm. How about, how about other members? I mean, you have a very direct personal reason why January 6th was, was a turning point in, in your perspective of things. Do you think other members of Congress have felt the same way or not, not in, in the way that you're feeling it, but it's changed the way they collaborate with each other? Uh, it did at the beginning. I had a hard time. Um, at the time, I was on four committees, including I was a vice chair of the Rules Committee, which is where everything comes together. Very dear friend on the other side, uh, very respected conservative Republican. I said, we both like to read books. We like the Civil War in American history. And I ran into him. I said, you know, it was January 6th, but the fact that he was one of the 125 voter members who voted against certifying the election that same day. And I've I've had multiple conversations. It was really hard at the beginning because I just tell people who voted against it, I'm having a real challenge dealing with you given what we went through and the fact that you verified what I viewed as extortion and terrorism by voting against it. And because you were afraid or afraid of the political consequences, I still haven't been able to figure out. And I always say, I would hope that if the shoes were in the opposite vote, foot, I, w I wouldn't have done what you did. So it's I'm getting past it, but it's been a problem. Okay, okay. Because I, I, you know, we, we'd, we'd started talking before we went on about various philosophers like like Voltaire. And I, I one of the ones that, that he said that I, when I started to prepare for this thing today, I was thinking, hmm. And it goes, if you want to know who controls you, uh, look at who you are not allowed to criticize. <laughs> Uh, that was crazy Frenchman, huh? Yeah, yeah, no, and and uh, you know, it's it's something that that I think has certainly affected the American consciousness. I just don't know how it's affected the American consciousness, and I, I appreciate your your being candid with us about about some of the personal things that have been involved with these sorts of things that are so extraordinary in American history and American experience, and they do have an effect. You can't ignore them uh, when you're doing doing your uh, your business as a, as a congressman. I have, have one last question for you, and, and it sort of 
summarizes what we've been talking about today. Um, in today's political arenas, and these are certainly those that you're most familiar with, uh, are civic civility and collaboration uh, still operative as they is the ab attributes of uh, of our government, or are they merely thought of as no, this is something that occurred from another age, and and uh, uh, they're disregarded because of that. You know, I, I, I talk a lot about books. There's two books that really have helped console me. One is called The Age of Acrimony. It was done by the Smithsonian's historian on Congress. It talks about post-Civil War um, and how Congress was very similar and society was. You had steam travel, immigration, the telegraph, which was a big part of, it's very much like the internet relative to this. There's another one by a Berkeley professor, uh, Adam Hosclaw, called American Midnight about World War I period. So there have been other periods in our history where we've struggled with this, which has been some consolation. Um, I think we'll get back. I think, but the practice of getting back is facilitated by examples of success. And for me, at my age, if I can do that a little bit, it's tremendously rewarding. Okay. Well, Mark, thank you very much for, for being with us, for celebrating Law Day with us. Uh, I, uh, I really enjoyed having an opportunity to talk with you. I hope you've enjoyed at least some of the questions that I thought were pertinent to, uh, to the sort of work you do as, as, a, as a member of Congress. Um, I, I was sort of curious if, if you find in your experience now at the local level and the state level and, and, the, and the federal level, uh, whether or not these three things had more meaning to you when you're in the local level rather than the federal level. And it sounds like they may, may have had. Madison was a genius. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much again and, uh, and uh, for celebrating Law Day with us. And uh, I'm just going to pause for a second to allow the, uh, uh, the, the IT people to, uh, to do their thing. Uh, and uh, I wish you a very, very, uh, very prosperous new year. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks for having me. In the middle of, of the uh, uh, the spring, but but uh, a good good year. Thank you.